All right, here we go. All right, hello, hello, minasan, konnichiwa. Thank you so much for joining us today for our special webinar. Uh, my name is Yoshi Domoto. I'm the executive director of the Japan America Society of Georgia. And so thoroughly are joining us today to learn about the digitization of Japan. Uh, certainly Japan is Georgia's number one foreign investor as over 600 Japanese companies operate in our state. And these companies have invested about $11 billion in our state's economy uh, and employ nearly 40,000 people. So there's a lot going on business-wise, certainly between Japan and Georgia. But pressures from overseas partners, fintech, the drop in Japanese population, and generational change uh, have made digital transformation in Japan inevitable. Uh, so definitely, we're going to be learning more about how Japanese businesses um, and the landscape in Japan is changing with the emergence of digital technology and what practices are succeeding. Uh, today, we are featuring Professor William Baber from Kyoto University. Uh, and the webinar will present practical and theoretical cases on how Japanese industry is adapting or not to changes in digital technology, exposing gaps and strengths in digitization in Japan. But without further ado, I would like to introduce our moderator uh, and the co-chair of the Programs Committee of the Japan American Society and Associate Director of Georgia Tech Cyber Center for International uh, Business, Education, and Research, uh, Mr. Jim Hodley. Uh, Hodley-sensei, yoroshiku onegaishimasu. Thank you, Yoshi. Um, it, well, well, I certainly don't have to introduce myself because you've, you've taken care of, of all of that for me. I appreciate that. Uh, I do work at the uh, Center for International Business Education and Research at uh, Georgia Tech, and through that position, uh, I have come to know uh, Will Baber. Um, uh, hopefully, he's okay with me calling him Will. Uh, of course. <laughs> and I, I have to say that he is both a, a scholar and, and a very wonderful person, and we're, we're very honored to, to have him join us. Uh, we're here to discuss the book, which Yoshi gave you the full title for, uh, Transforming Japanese Business, Rising to the Digital Ch uh, Challenge. And for me, the fascinating thing about this is that it is very practical uh, for an academic tome. It, it, it touches on true stories rather than uh, focusing only on, on theory, um, although there is certainly some of that there as well. And so we're going to be able to uh, listen to Will talk about stories of companies that he has actually interacted with in Japan, particularly small and medium sized businesses, particularly ones that are family owned, who have had to embrace the na digital nature of the world uh, going forward, because a lot of small and, and medium sized businesses in Japan, as they have around the world, have gone out of business because they have not adjusted to the new uh, to use an old word paradigm. So um, Will is both uh, one of the editors of this volume, and he's also um, author, author or co-author of several chapters. So you're not here to hear me talk, you're here to hear Will talk. So I will turn it over to him and we'll um, uh, come back for questions and answers. If you do have questions during the uh, presentation at any time, please use the Q&A tool at the bottom and we will try to answer as many of those questions as we can. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Jim. Um, I will uh, share my screen and, and get going. And, um, and yeah, we'll take questions. If something comes up, uh, Jim and Yoshi, uh, let me know and, and give me a stop signal. And uh, then we can, we can deal with something uh, that needs immediate attention or what have you. I don't mind being interrupted, um, but generally we'll try to put the uh, Q&A at the end. So, yeah, the, uh, the, the topic today is specifically about small and family businesses. Uh, the book uh, that uh, I co-edited 
is about uh, you know various kinds of businesses and society at large and what's happening there so today we're taking a little bit more focus um, uh, look at uh, what's going on and i'm going to talk mainly about these five companies and then uh, in the q a time we, we can get broader and talk about more things so uh, th these are Hoso, Kinshi, uh, Masumune Sake, Sawaya Matsumoto Sake, uh, Ippodo Tea, and a company called Hilltop, which uh, at first glance doesn't look very Japanese, does it? Um, but the, uh, the first four are older companies, and they're all family owned, and uh, they, they fall into the category of uh, medium-sized businesses. Um, so they're particularly interesting uh, because they're very old and traditional, uh, but they have moved their, um, they've moved part of their business or their product or something uh, forward into modern times with success. Uh, it's a big challenge. So Hoso was founded in 1688 and uh, they were a, a weaver uh, kimono weaver in the Nishijin Ori district here in uh, Kyoto. And this industry, as kimono has gone out of style, of course, and uh, people wear Western clothing pretty much all the time, um, the market has gone down and down and down. And they've moved from being what was, uh, uh, you know, a luxury item to an item that's seldom worn. You know, it's worn. Uh, uh, for very important occasions and in certain kinds of situations and so on. Uh, so they were able to modernize a couple of things. One was the uh, 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 technology. So they uh, worked on digitalization of weaving techniques and they built this into the, uh, into the software that they themselves developed. So this was in-house material. They didn't uh, in-house design and, and engineering. They didn't go out and uh, outsource this. They didn't uh, uh, have to do a technology transfer. Um, they also didn't have to uh, create a division of uh, engineers or something. This was a do-it-yourself kind of thing. So they had the expertise to operate um, some numerical control uh, machines, but uh, you know these, these things age and have to be updated. So they, they took the step further to uh, develop uh, artificial intelligence uh, software to make it possible for them to do more complex, more demanding designs and put them ahead of the competition. So when we're talking about um, fabrics, we have to think about uh, not only how it looks, but how it wears and what you can do with it and how it feels. So there is a physical texture to traditional textiles that's very important. And this is something that they incorporated in their uh, philosophy from um, already before this development and change uh, was the, the tactile, customized individual nature of those kind of crafted textiles. And they want, in their philosophy, is to connect humans to the past and the present, partly with that physical touch. And if you want to uh, uh, learn more about this company, of course, I put the, uh, the website here, but there is a, uh, a Harvard style case written by one of my uh, colleagues in Kyoto, who is uh, Professor Sugai at Doshisha University. And this is a very good case, so you can get really into the detail of that company. And as an example of how successful they are with their change, uh, here is their uh, new building um, at the new site. This is just a couple years old. And uh, this is outside of the um, Nishijin neighborhood. This is closer to downtown. And uh, what you see here is so dramatic and elegant that it's hard to even uh, get your eyes on what, <laughs> what this big, black, uh, super elegant, uh, up-to-date building is. 
And, you know, that's, uh, that's a very visible sign of success that they've made this transition. And uh, part of their transition has been uh, not only the technology, but uh, they expanded their business model to reach luxury makers and luxury buyers overseas. So you'll find their uh, textiles in the interiors of crafted Rolls Royces, uh, for example, uh, and other kinds of one-off, um, very special kinds of products. And of course, if you're looking for that uh, gorgeous Jackie Onassis uh, clutch purse, they've got one for you. So you can visit their catalog online and get an idea about this. <clears throat> So the, the second company that I want to briefly introduce is Kinshi Masamune. So this is a sake maker. It's something I'm always interested in, in talking about and tasting. And also an older company, um, 1780s. And they, um, they have modernized the company to uh, expand a little bit from uh, sake into uh, hospitality and in particular, a uh, craft beer. So craft beer is developing quickly in Japan, not as far along as it is in the United States. So the, uh, the older crowd among the listeners will know that uh, 1970s and 80s uh, beer landscape in the United States was terrible, flavorless, and uninteresting. And now it's uh, completely revolutionized. So Japan is in this process too. And Kinshi Masamune is uh, participating. Uh, so th this, is, um, uh, this is not a small step. So I don't want to uh, suggest that it's just a new product or something or a, or a new experiment. Um, this is a, uh, requires different controls, different systems, different expertise, uh, new staff, new location, and so on. So the, uh, in the course of history, the sake production moved out of the center of Kyoto city to Fushimi with most of the other uh, big sake makers in the city. But the, the beer is made uh, on site downtown in Kyoto. So when you visit, you can uh, see their museum, their original building and uh, have beer that's produced there. And I want to mention their philosophy too because they also have a distinct philosophy that is to uh, contribute to uh, what, what you see here, contribute to people's happiness and be very customer focused, customer oriented. And they are fundamentally tied to the culture and the flavors and the food and the uh, eating culture and drinking culture of the city of Kyoto. So, you know, their philosophy is customer focused and uniquely Kyoto's. And here's a, um, an image from uh, inside their production facility with a pleasant looking glass of beer. Uh, the, the third company that I want to mention is uh, Sawaya Matsumoto. This is also a sake maker, um, also about a little more than 200 years old. And they are combining, in, in terms of uh, technology, they are combining traditional um, manual methods of sake making with up-to-date controls. So on the one hand, they retain the labor intensive and very physical work of mixing uh, sake at the right speed, at the right temperature, at the right time uh, with technology to, uh, that's really required to uh, mon monitor and maintain uh, things like temperature, um, aeration, oxygenation, and so on, to nail, the, to get the exact flavor that they want, and to uh, work with the little, with the really minute differences that come with the crop of rice every year. So they're, they're integrating and bringing together, you know, very traditional centuries old uh, work with, uh, uh, technologies, uh, in, including, uh, you know, uh, 
distributed sensors, Internet of Technologies kind of uh, work uh, to uh, to make the product. And again, I, I want to uh, mention the the philosophy, and I'll I'll explain later why I think this is all important. But um, so their philosophy is in three parts. You know, one is to preserve tradition, and that's the physical uh, part of the uh, of the work, the manual part, and the second part is to break that tradition. So you have to then consider um, what parts of the tradition you need to keep or remove or adjust and how that's going to work with your product, your quality and your market. And then the third part is to create uh, new value that uh, that comes out of that. So this is um, a philosophy that is one that you have to, uh, it, it's, not, it's not quick and easy to grasp. And I think this is true of the, uh, any good philosophy. It's one that you have to uh, internalize. And in it, when you internalize it, it becomes part of your uh, thinking and your operating and, and that uh, helps to drive uh, your innovation. So when we look at the, I, I chose the picture of a, just a label because you can see this is very modernist. So if we look at um, most sake labels, they tend to have um, uh, traditionally Japanese kind of minimalist uh, calligraphy. And sometimes there will be art that's usually uh, from 100 or 200 or, or years ago or older, and there'll be those kind of themes. So this looks uh, more like a wine bottle, but super minimalist. So it's a nice, uh, uh, particularly nice realization of Japanese aesthetic and modernizing what the uh, customer expects and what the customer thinks about the, uh, the product. So um, this is a, a great place to visit. So when uh, Kyoto is more accessible for visitors in the near future, we hope, um, I, I do recommend going to Fushimi and uh, visiting Matsumoto in particular. Uh, and the fourth uh, older company I want to talk about is Ipodo. Uh, this is a tea company. And tea is um, a little bit like uh, textiles and kimono and sake in Japan. So the market is declining. Um, people generally, the, the uh, consumers in, in the general public don't understand so well the culture around these things, including tea. And they don't uh, know so much about the flavor and handling and drinking of it. So tea is... Um, completely a mass commodity and you can go to any vending machine and get a cold drink of tea anytime. So, you know, this is different from kimono, for example, but similar in that uh, it's not so much valued as it was previously. And Ipodo, um, their, their reaction to dealing with the, the commoditization and the uh, lower um, less, lower understanding and the decreasing market, you know, as, as uh, Coca-Cola or what have you takes uh, market share and coffee takes market share. Of course, Japan is a very big uh, consumer of coffee. Um, their uh, reaction was to move up and to um, move up the market into uh, premium market and also to uh, include the experience of tea in the drinking and selling of it. So they opened uh, shops outside of Kyoto, all around Japan, and also overseas. So there's at least one in New York City. And their goal here uh, was to get inside the thinking of current day tea drinkers and access what they wanted to know and what they cared about. So uh, 
you know, one of the things when I, when I talk to my uh, Japanese students about tea, I say, you know, what is tea for? And then they're like, okay, it's when you're thirsty and you need some refreshment. But for example, they don't think about the, uh, the, concent the concentration benefit of tea drinking. So one of the reasons that tea became popular in the monasteries of Japan was that during meditation and during long days of uh, learning or working on script uh, manuscripts and, and so on, tea was a way to stay alert and stay focused. So this idea of, of tea as a focusing drink or concentration drink has, has really diminished, which, you know, if you said that, if you went back in time and said that to someone 200 years ago, they would be completely shocked because that's the whole point of tea or, you know, one of the main points. Uh, so the, the company uh, had to do a deep dive or continually, continually does a deep dive into what uh, tea drinkers think and want. And they also educate the, the tea drinkers. And they do that through workshops in the tea salons. And this has become central to the mission of the company. So their philosophy um, is that you have to adapt, but you also have to remain devoted to what uh, the top quality of tea is. And here's a picture of their building. So you can see that they're really uh, happy to rely on, um, on the traditional look. This is a Meiji era building and you know, really looks at so much dark and wood and not flashy. And, but it has its own uh, identity and elegance. And when you walk down the street, this is on Teramachi in Kyoto, uh, when you walk down the street, you, you know, you uh, immediately recognize and identify. There's the ugly modern building next to it. And, and here's the cool traditional one. And in the morning when they open up the, uh, the sliding doors that you see in front there, um, the inside is, is neat, clean, minimalist, pleasant, and there are well-informed clerks working there to package and sell the tea. And, you know, of course, having a, a well-informed salesperson or a clerk uh, is, is uh, not the way modern retail business works, but they've got it and they're very successful and the customers appreciate this. So I, these are, uh, these more traditional older companies. And now I, I want to switch focus to um, Hilltop, which is a lot newer, a lot more recent. And when you look at the name Hilltop, you think, is, is that Japanese? You know, what, what's the connection here? Well, it was founded as Yamamoto, Yamamoto Seiko, uh, Yamamoto uh, Precision Engineering. And, excuse me. Uh, it was uh, founded as a company that did what we now think of as traditional conventional precision machine tool cutting. So they uh, produced the uh, small parts that went into uh, cars and aircraft and uh, Shinkansen, for example. Um, and these were very typically screws or fasteners, brackets, and they would not make a small number of them. They made as many as possible and tried to get as big an order as possible. And the company has uh, changed since then, since 1980, it's gone through three, uh, it's now just has finished its third transition. So the grandson of the founder is now the, uh, the head of the company. And <clears throat> here's the, the level of success achieved by the second leader who has just retired. 
so you can see that they went from a small machine shop doing work that was uh, uninteresting, repetitive, uh, dirty, where the, the workers are handling the materials and standing at a lathe, and there's uh, oil around, and volatile chemicals in the air, and equipment, uh, and so on. You know, not not a wildly dangerous um, environment, but also, you know, an industrial environment. So it's a little bit on the side of, of definitely dirty, definitely dull, and a little bit dangerous. It's not ideal work. And one of the problems with this is that uh, over time you lose the, the creativity and interest and commitment of the workers. You know, of course, that's that's how humans are. And so as much as they might be uh, devoted to the company and their co-workers, uh, you're kind of squandering the human resources by being in a business like that. And Another problem with this kind of mass production business is that prices tend to drift down over time. So even if there is uh, inflation that makes the numbers bigger, your net profit margin tends to go down because the uh, barrier to entry is low and the big companies at the top of the production chain, at the top of the pyramid, are uh, always trying to develop alternatives and, and another company in another location. And then as globalization progressed, that kind of work went to uh, developing countries with uh, totally different cost structures. So we know how, how this goes and it doesn't end well. So the second generation owner uh, made a quite radical uh, set of changes and he moved the company from stage one to stage two from this precision manufacturing where they were, I have written here second or third tier supply. Really, they were, they were like uh, level five or six. So they're making uh, a screw, an object that goes into an assembly that goes into another assembly that goes up the chain. And then finally, somebody puts it into uh, a a, a Shinkansen train or something like that. So he moved the, the uh, company into a partly digitalized uh, product uh, or part, partially digitalized uh, system. So this meant that the, uh, the workers uh, had to change. So some of them left by retirement and attrition and the younger ones and, and the more interested ones uh, trained with the second generation leader uh, as engineers. And they learned the software programming to, uh, to use the uh, uh, computer controlled CNC machine tools and to get maximum uh, kind of productivity out of them and maximum accuracy. And they totally changed from doing large amounts of a few kinds of items to doing small amounts of many kinds of items. <clears throat> and this was higher scale and higher value add. And it also put them in the situation that they could say no. And this is uh, very important to uh, Mr. Yamamoto, the, the second generation uh, manager. So. He focused on doing prototyping work that would be creative and interesting and, and difficult. And when they were had opportunities to, uh, when the company said, okay, you made our one of them, you made a prototype that's great. And now, you know, we need 10,000 of them. Please take the contract. They said, no, thanks. And they moved on to the next thing. So this, um, you know, this is uh, completely opposite thinking and uh, you know, very forward thinking and really taking control of the business. So in the third stage, um, there is more digitalization and uh, uh, another uh, kind of strong approach to the market. I'll, I'll explain that in a couple of minutes. 
so that you know that stage one precision machining is very standard. You have suppliers that make the tools, and you have uh, equipment, uh, and, you, and you have blocks of steel and material coming in. And <clears throat> with time, they began to focus on aluminum as a specialization. So that uh, has to be handled differently than steel. It takes different uh, tools and skills and more kind of personal uh, know-how. But you know the outputs are very conventional here. And your contact with the end user is, you don't have contact with the end user. You're just going up the supply chain. In that second business model, um, that's much more interesting. Uh, you know, the inputs are uh, data, so the uh, or drawings. So the customer contacts you and they say, "We need a thingy that does something, something, and it has to fit into this parameter in this space, and it's going to be about so big, and it's for a it's for a carburetor, or it's for a." Um, uh, a machine that makes something else, or it's uh, uh, going to be on a satellite that uh, goes into uh, orbit or something like this. And the engineer at the customer side gets into close communication with the engineer at Hilltop, and they work out all of the specifications and the details, and they sometimes co-engineer uh, the piece of equipment, and then they make it. And the physical object is the output, so it goes into a box, and it, and the uh, delivery company takes it back to the customer. Right, so what have they captured in between? In stage one, they could capture some money. In stage two, they could capture uh, a little more money, which is nice. But very importantly, they could capture the digitalized data around um, cutting the block of aluminum, uh, any kind of finishing, and all of the knowledge around the engineering of the object and the product itself. So here they are um, gathering data over the course of uh, 20 and then 30 years, 35 years, and so on, and amassing a huge amount of knowledge about um, the machining and the engineering. Uh, so some of this they can use to get better and faster, and some of it they can use to uh, make the equipment work more efficiently. And they're also developing uh, a lot of uh, software engineering skills here. So we kind of, uh, uh, we know uh, that Japan is very short on uh, software engineering skills. And whereas in the United States, software engineers tend to make very high salaries and so on. Here they may be seen as kind of run-of-the-mill engineers and the capacity is not developing. But Hilltop recentered their business and their staff around this. Okay, so they've, they've got um, this knowledge and they've got uh, uh, skill set and they've got um, a lot of data. So what are we going to do with that? Um, and, and how does that impact the people and why, why is that important? So let's not think so much about the uh, product and equipment or the raw product coming in and it gets worked on and it goes out. Let's think about the, this other supply that comes in. And this is, this is challenges. So it's not that the phone rings and you pick it up and somebody wants 10,000 small widgets. It's that the phone rings and you grab it and you think, we're going to get some kind of weird thing that we've never had to do before. And who's it going to be? Is it, is it going to be the space agency? Is it going to be Toyota? Is it going to be um, a, a food manufacturer? Is it going to be an artist? 
Uh, so they, they've even done some uh, projects for artists that were extremely challenging. And, um, and what, they, what they take out of that is that the, uh, the workers can be very satisfied with what they're doing and highly engaged and they care about it. And the, uh, the atmosphere is uh, more of a, of a design uh, kind of a shop. But it's, it's interesting, it's partly industrial and there's a cutting floor and a manufacturing floor and it's all very clean and uh, high-tech equipment. Uh, but the attitude among the people is, <laughs> we've got this problem that we have to solve <laughs> and we have to figure it out. So now we have engaged workers and we've got a lot of data and we've got a lot of skill. And the, uh, the Mr. Yamamoto, Yamamoto-san, who was the shacha, the head of the company here, is ready to retire. And his son is uh, about 30 and it's time to push it, uh, move it to the next generation. So what, what we have is um, a company that's very successful. You saw the nice building. And they're working on this kind of uh, uh, what we call a long tail business model. So you see on the, on the left side, there's the number of products. That's mass production. So few customers, very high number of, of products. And on the right side here, you see it goes off thin, thin, thin. That's many customers, but they're only doing one or two products each. So they, they don't even have many repeat customers. Customers are very satisfied and they talk about it and they spread the word to other customers, but they don't come back very often. Um, that's just the nature of this business. <clears throat> so we've got uh, the, the philosophy that built this model of the long tail challenges, uh, small, uh, very large number of customers, the uh, engaged workers is something like this. Uh, it's never to be bored. So the uh, Yamamoto-san, uh, you know, he doesn't want dirty, dull, and dangerous. He said, we, we can't be bored anymore. This is not what humans do well. Humans need to take challenges and be interested. And they, that means they need to continually learn. So everyone who goes into the company gets a, a certain level of um, engineering experience and skill, even if they're basically hired as a marketing person and or whatever it is you know um and this also means that you have to uh create your future as it emerges so the company is comfortable with a you know moderate level of constant risk taking so to complete a project they say oh my god you know we need um, this piece of equipment that we don't have and it costs a huge amount of money we're going to buy it we do it and we're going to learn it and then it's there uh, for the future, for the next uh, project. And the way Yamamoto puts this together, his summary of this is that you have to nurture the human. So there's no focus on profit, even though the company's very profitable. And there's no focus on uh, the customer, even though the customers are very satisfied. The focus is really on the uh, on the workers, and everything else takes care of itself. So, you know, this is this is a, a kind of radical. <laughs> um, sometimes the uh, uh, other companies have, uh, you know, when, when he talks about this, he's uh, Yamamoto has been on TV and so on from time to time, and very active guy. And, you know, other business owners uh, say, you know, they, they try to challenge him and say, you're not telling the whole story. That just can't be. But, you know, this is what he says day in, day out. This is what he tells his employees, his customers, his visitors, everyone, is nurture the human, keep them healthy, active, 
mentally alert and you get great results. So we've got all this together. We've got a philosophy. We've got a company that's firing on all cylinders. We've got um, uh, profits. We've got great quality. Um, what's going to happen next? So the third generation uh, who has, as I said, has just taken over in the last year or so, uh, is moving forward in a very, um, uh, to do something really uh, big and uh, kind of radical. So it's going to go from uh, just doing the prototyping to managing uh, what the customers want. Remember we said that the customers would do a prototype, but when they said, please do the volume production, uh, Hilltop said, no thanks. Well, now they're aiming to direct that work to other companies. And this means that they have uh, created and are expanding a platform for this kind of industry that can take the project from prototyping to mass production and they get uh, uh, the benefit of knowing that uh, throughout. And because they have that 30, 35 years of, of raw technical data about cutting aluminum and manufacturing, they can now transfer precisely what is necessary to a different maker who can make it cost effectively and uh, do it at whatever location is convenient. In other words, they are at the point where they are uh, in a controlling position of the industry. Uh, so as this uh, grows and develops in the next few years, you know, they're, they're moving from a niche in the industry to a uh, higher position in the industry. Pretty fantastic. So how do you get, um, to all the, how do you get this kind of success, right? Uh, so as they're moving into stage uh, three, you know, they're profitable. They're better than just profitable. Um, they don't have to do this, but they did, right? Um, and they did it with some trial and error, but without any serious uh, mistakes and uh, without uh, any um, big projects that failed and ate up a couple million dollars. So they, they did this very well. And they did this um, with a, uh, they, they did it, uh, you know, do it yourself, I think is a good phrase for this. And the, in academia, we call this effectuation, which sounds really cool, but it means do it yourself. And uh, <laughs> uh, this means that they, they knew what their resources were and didn't overspend. And they didn't go to the banks. That's, that's anathema to uh, the Yamamotos. They didn't borrow. They didn't uh, look for equity investments. They didn't hire in new um high skilled staff to kind of take over the company or or something like that they built their people up they worked with what they had they they developed their network of contacts and let it evolve they, they you know they still had breakthrough ideas and concepts that that came from themselves right so part of this was to set a challenge to the, uh, the younger Yamamoto who was going to take over. And uh, the challenge was from, from the, his father was, you go to California and uh, found our first subsidiary in the US market. You go to America, not necessarily California, but, um, and the younger Yamamoto was like, well, I don't speak English very well. True, yeah, okay, he, he didn't speak English terribly well. He didn't have this kind of experience and he was mainly focused on the engineering. And this was the personal direct challenge. This is 
uh, not a moonshot, you know, like trying to attain something totally wild and, and beyond belief. This is an attainable goal. Other companies, have, other Japanese companies have gone to California and been successful, small ones, big ones, there's some networks there. Go do it, get on a plane, go find it. So he went there with a uh, starter staff of just uh, uh, two people and himself and uh, you know, very limited uh, language skills. And uh, they, they found the location, they got their equipment, they got their permits, they got customers and they got moving. And they, so they took the stage two model to California, became successful. Um, and at the same time, we're working hard on trying to understand what their next concept would be, that stage three kind of platform for the industry. And, you know, click forward two years and suddenly the ideas are flowing. The personal network has been expanded from just niche industry in Japan to this much broader base of experienced Japanese American businesses and business people in and around California. Um, so, you know, mainly they're, they're, they're in the uh, LA area in Orange County. Um, and uh, so that's, that's where their uh, network is, but they have customers uh, up and down the Pacific coast and, and some from the East coast. And even with COVID their business has been about doubling the last uh, three, four years each year. So you know, this is a big success. Um, and here's the uh, gentleman himself. This is Mr. Yamamoto, uh, who has just retired. And you can see he's, um, this is how he looks all the time, right? So he's, he's always uh, uh, kind of upbeat and engaged and focused. And he's always on message. And his message is always, do this, learn this, uh, make the, take the step, make the, take the challenge, figure it out, do it, and stay engaged. And this is um, his son, uh, the younger Yamamoto, Yuki-san, who is now the uh, head of the company. And, uh, you know, this, I have to say, you know, th there was a little bit of a personal uh, journey for him. So he went from being kind of a quiet engineer in the, over at that desk over there to, you see him in these pictures, he's also brimming with confidence here and uh, moving the company into new uncharted space. And, you know, they're, they're really good with that. <laughs> it, it's, uh, it's really nice and remarkable to see. So they assembled that digital knowledge, intangible know-how, built it into their philosophy and out of that comes really striking success. So these are some, some points that these companies have um, mostly in common. So they all have a philosophy and it's not just uh, kind of the uh, airheaded sounds good sound bite kind of philosophy this is in, internalized into the management and the workers. Uh, they have product and service innovation. You know, so there's creativity going on. Um, they've repositioned themselves. Most of them have repositioned themselves in the industry. So they've gone from supplier to niche supplier, or they've moved somewhere else, or they moved up or, or uh, down into the industry somewhere. And the, uh, at least three of these have taken on the new generation challenge. I'm not sure about the, uh, uh, the leadership at the two uh, sake makers. I'm not sure where they are right now. Um, and mostly they have some kind of digital uh, aspect to them. So I should include that check mark there for, uh, for Matsumoto too, uh, because that's, uh, that's definitely, um, there's definitely a digital component there too. Um, 
but the, this is um, can at least say that having that digital component is a gateway to being able to do something bigger and better and different. So uh, data and digitalized knowledge is a resource just as much as having clean water for your sake. So one of the really concrete lessons that I, I like to draw out of this is that um, if you're not digitalizing, you're not creating the resources that you need for uh, the, the current happening generation of, uh, of oncoming technologies like uh, artificial intelligence and 5G everything and uh, Internet of Things and highly connected uh, uh, optimize, optimization. So if you're not digitizing, you're missing something. And if you don't have uh, a real company philosophy, you need to think about that and uh, develop and, and understand why you're in business and what that means to your employees and customers. And that is going to uh, help you uh, not only survive, but thrive and, and make it into the next, uh, next generation because generations are changing much faster now. So it's not just that you stand around waiting for the, old, the older person to retire. Um, you know, technology generations are coming at the rate of five and 10 year gaps. And that means you invest heavily and you stay uh, above water or you're in deep, deep trouble, deep yogurt as my father likes to put it. And nobody wants to be in deep yogurt. So some other lessons here, you know, one is that there, the, the strategies for each firm have to be customized. You can't just say this works for everybody. Uh, so you have to work with, understand what you have, what you are, figure it out yourself. Um, the new generation has to be challenged and, and has to face some difficulty. And you know, this repositioning is going to be important. And you have to know what your strengths and abilities are. And I, I yeah, digitize what you do. So that's um, where I need to stop. I think Jimmy should have waved me, flagged me to stop sooner um, and see if there are any questions or comments that I should uh, should deal with. All right, thank you. Thank you, Will, great, great presentation. Um, um, I, I do have uh, several questions that I wanted to, uh, to ask you, uh, and let me just go with the first one, um, which is, uh, I wrote it down. Uh, Japan is home to some of the world's oldest businesses. Uh, many of the businesses that you highlighted have been around for, for centuries, but um, there are several companies in Japan that have been around since the 700s. Um, Nishiyama Onsen in, in, uh, in Yamanashi, for example, has been operating for 52 generations. Is there something unique to Japanese companies that have allowed them to sustain this long? Uh, one of the strategies for, um, for long-term, sustaining yourself very long-term is not to uh, uh, grow too fast. So uh, you can grow, you can shrink, but uh, any manager will tell you that uh, managing for growth is a lot easier than managing for decline. So if you need to, um, if you get 10% more work and contracts, you can hire 10% more people um, and, uh, or you can make your current people work 10% harder until you get the next level and then hire more people. But if you're declining, you know, and you've got a staff of, of, of 100 people, you can, you know, you can fire five or 10% and then it gets very difficult. When you have 10 people, and you fire one person, you're, you're looking at real trouble and you can't fire half a person. Um, so careful growth is one of the strategies that we see in Shinisei companies, um, not, not overgrowing, not overexpanding. And um, another strategy would have to be a, a, a really broad basket of strategies is how do you handle your transition? 
from generation to generation. So there's a number of ways of doing that. Some companies, um, some of these very old companies are, um, the shares are distributed to uh, family members. And then when the, the older person steps down, the younger ones, cousins, siblings, what have you come together and they elect someone who has to then um, buy out the others step by step or in blocks or what have you. And uh, then there's the strategy of uh, adopting a competent son <laughs> or um, uh, putting it into uh, hiring managers that will keep certain elements of it, so on and so forth. So what you don't have are crisis moments like Twitter has just faced. So, you know, Twitter, um, you know, it's not a family business and it's a listed shareholding business, but, you know, to a large extent, it was Jack Dorsey's baby and, you know, he's forced into handing it over and <laughs> somebody's going to take it who does not have his uh, ideas about uh, his philosophy and his ethics and so on and so forth. So, you know, basically that's a catastrophe. Mm -hmm. And um, these uh, small older companies are very, very cautious and successful at avoiding those kind of crises. Thank you. Great. So that's a uh, short answer to a tough question. <laughs> I have a question from uh, Bindu Arya, one of our uh, participants this evening. Um, I'm going to do my best to ask it. Um, are Japanese firms beginning to use open strategy involving internal and external stakeholders in the strategic planning process as they make these transitions? Um, to a limited extent, yes. So um, I, I can think of um, some smaller technology companies that are uh, doing this. Um, and uh, maybe, maybe a good one to put a name on is a uh, artificial intelligence company called Hackerus. Uh, here in Kyoto. Um, the bigger companies uh, have talked about this and they, and they, they uh, open consortia for like the smart city consortia that, you know, Toyota has one and um, there's another consortium around Sharp, I think. Um, but they're, 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 it's not really in their DNA. They're not very comfortable with it. Is, is my feeling. Um, so there's still, a, a, it's very natural for uh, engineers at a Japanese company not to go to a barbecue with their friends and talk shop. Now, if you, that's part of that uh, uh, open innovation thing in, in the US and, and some cultures is that, yeah, people do go and chat. They, they go to the same bars or the same this or that or the other, they have their hobbies, they meet other people and they chat maybe more than they should and they share a lot of information. This is really good for the industry. Um, it's, it's not happening very much except in uh, maybe smaller up-to-date companies okay. here in Japan. All right. Uh, well, it, we, let's see, okay, now we don't have any other Q&A. Let me ask another question, which is actually related to something that I've noticed myself uh, related to Japanese small and medium sized companies in particular, not necessarily the ones that you've had, but a lot of the ones that you've, you've highlighted um, have products that seem like they would be in demand outside of Japan. And the companies that you highlighted in general, they've embraced the digital world, but there are lots uh, there's so many that don't sell outside of Japan that there's actually a cottage industry for firms that will act as go-betweens. It's like you want to buy some Japanese product and you can't get it and we'll buy it for you so that you have a Japanese address to ship it to and then we trans ship it to you and we handle all the payment and all this sort of thing. This to me seems very wasteful for, for Japanese firms that they're missing out on a lot of opportunity. Uh, they could be attracting a lot more foreign customers because every time that you put a barrier to a customer to acquiring your product or service, um, you're going to lose people. Um, what are the major impediments that are keeping these other firms, which have obvious overseas demands from selling directly to them? Um, there, there's a lot of barriers there. So one of them is still the language barrier. And this is certainly improving as uh, automatic translation is 
is becoming a thing. Um, uh, but there are structural barriers beyond that, like uh, banking and payments. So this is still relatively difficult. Um, the, the major Japanese banks are not retail friendly and they're not even terribly friendly towards um, uh, smallish business transactions and this kind of thing. Um, and there is, I, you know, every year I tell myself that the uh, sense of desperation is increasing in uh, Japanese industry regarding the decline of the Japanese market. And it's probably true, but it's still glacial. Um, so there is a sense, I believe, for plenty of small and medium companies that they will just simply ride the decline. And, you know, they're, they can still eat um, and they'll just let it go. And at, the, at another generation, it'll be gone, whether it's a decade or two decades out or something, uh, which is t a terrible shame, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think there is a, a slow transition of the old guard and there is a new generation certainly coming on that thinks differently and but they face all the barriers that a young generation faces you know they have lack of capital lack of experience lack of network and the uh, existing companies have low confidence in them so yeah th this is a you know the past 10 years have been a transitional decade for Japan and the next 10 years will be two and they will move faster and it will be harder. The, the yeah. glacier is melting from uh, global warming as it will. <laughs> yeah. All right. I, I see Yoshi. So, and I also am looking at the clock. I believe we've reached the, the end of our time. It was a fascinating talk. Thank you very much. Um, and, and applause. <laughs> you may not be able to hear folks, but uh, I'm definitely applauding you here. Uh, and I think they are as well. Uh, thank you for sharing um, your time with us and your, your expertise. Yeah, thank you very much. And I, I will, you know, audience members can uh, send me an email and get in contact with me. Okay. All right. Thank you. Bye bye, everyone. Oh, okay. Great. Thank you again, Professor Baber, for, for sharing your expertise with us. We certainly learned a lot. Again, for everyone tuning in, uh, you can learn more uh, about uh, the fascinating uh, kind of world of digitization of Japan and um, through his book. Uh, you can purchase his book on, on Amazon, certainly, and also uh, through his website as well. Uh, so all the websites and kind of the links to, to his book are uh, on the chat box, and we'll be sending that out by email as well, along with a survey after this program. Uh, but another virtual round of applause for Weber Sensei. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Weber. Uh, and I uh, look forward to um, maybe hopefully visiting you in Kyoto. Uh, and then hopefully you can visit us in uh, Atlanta and Georgia at some point as well. Uh, okay. But uh, before we finish uh, this evening, we do have a number of uh, many other upcoming events, uh, certainly uh, as uh, you know, we, we are uh, trying to keep busy uh, during this time of kind of semi-pandemic uh, and kind of a post-COVID. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, this Saturday, uh, we will have our monthly Nihongo Edukai uh, virtual language exchange uh, uh, where Japanese and Americans can share kind of uh, language exchange skills. Uh, next week, uh, May 10th, we have a Kaiobikai networking dinner at Nakato Japanese Restaurant. On May 12th, we have a webinar for Japanese expats. Uh, it's a program about uh, the advantages of being able to uh, kind of decipher between similarities and differences in the U.S. Japan world. Uh, then we have some cultural events uh, as well coming up. Uh, Ouchi Gohan will be learning how to make uh, teddy bear omuraisu, uh, along with the Japan American Society of Boston and Houston. Uh, and then later, May 19th, we have a another book uh, talk. Uh, this one, Tokyo Junkie. Uh, 60 years of bright lights, uh, back alleyways, and baseball in Tokyo, right? Uh, uh, featuring uh, author uh, Robert Whiting. Uh, and then May 21st, we have a Ikebana workshop at Nakato Restaurant. And then we'll be finishing out the month on May 29th, a 
baseball day out with the Atlanta Braves in which the Consul General of Japan will be the honorary captain for the game. So lots of uh, events coming up. So certainly join us. Uh, and we'll be uh, sharing the recorded uh, video of today's webinar with, with everyone as well. So definitely stay tuned and uh, look out for that video. Uh, but uh, thank you again for Professor Weber for joining us and look forward to seeing you all again next time. Thanks so much. Take care. Be safe.